Okay, colleagues, greetings. So, unfortunately, we are still on quarantine, so I am going to try to record the lecture online, which is a bit of a challenging experience, and I also have a lot of things I want to say, but I'll try to be as coherent as possible. Now, technically speaking, this is a lecture within the philosophy of science course. However, however, um, um, it it is... The, the, the result, the genealogical origin of this lecture is the two courses that I teach, which are Introduction to Social and Political Philosophy, one of them, and uh, uh, the other uh, is Modern Political Theory. So this is, this is basically, uh, it's like, I keep talking about how I think it's an asset of mine that I teach, again, both political philosophy and philosophy of science. And this is my, this is my attempt to, uh, 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 to meditate on the interface between these two approaches. And specifically, I want to talk about the notion of truth and notion of ideology. Um, and so, so, again, I don't find this format particularly well-suited, but I'll try my best. Again, some ideas are that I'm trying to get out are uh, big, but, you know, basically, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Anyway... So, uh, uh, let me start somewhere. So, I think a very fruitful dichotomy um, is the dichotomy of hermeneutics of trust and hermeneutics of suspicion. So, apologies for using technical terms, but sometimes it's useful. Uh, hermeneutics of trust versus suspicion. Um, and it's basically... Mm, Hermeneutics refers to understanding or, or interpretation. Like, should you be, in general, like, should you be skeptical? Uh, so, like, skepticism versus... Um, sometimes in philosophy people talk about charity, the principle of charity. Charity in the sense that, you know, well, I mean, trust. Skepticism versus... Uh, I don't use the... I don't want to use the word faith because I feel that the word faith could have different connotations. So, let me write the word... But let me write the word trust. Um, and so, uh, 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 in an important respect, so I'm, I have to warn you, I'm trying to talk about a lot of things at the same time. We'll see exactly how it goes. Um, but, you know, let me, let me start broad. Let me start, you know, as broad as I can. The three names that I want to focus on this year in general are uh, Nietzsche, Marx, and Buddha in whichever order. So, well, <laughs> chronologically, yeah. Nietzsche, Marx, <laughs> Buddha at the end, because, you know, I feel that I'm not, it's like, B Buddha for me, like, Miroku Bosatsu, <laughs> Buddha for me is somebody who's gonna come in the future. It's like, mm. but no, I, I mean it quite seriously. So it's like, uh, uh, Nietzsche, I'm fairly um, happy with the lecture. I gave on Nietzsche. Marx, I feel, is a lecture on progress. This is the only lecture which I would want to re-record for my course on Coursera. And uh, uh, Buddha is in the future. It's very, mu very much a, a open ended work in progress. By the way, so if you want to hear me talk about all of this stuff in much more coherent way, I hope, you should watch my course on Coursera because I spend there uh, uh, something like um, 16, le well, I mean, exactly 16 lectures talking about all this stuff in a slightly more coherent fashion and also like today what i want to do is i want to try to give you my own opinion like the kind of impression that i get the kind of ideas that i, I have in my head after recording the 16 lectures for coursera so um there are many starting points so let me um mm, i don't know let me try to signal at least a couple so one is this idea that Nietzsche and Marx and Buddha, all three believe uh, that truth is difficult to attain. So there's a certain element of skepticism. And when we talk about skepticism, at least two aspects I think are very important. So uh, um, one aspect is that human mind is limited. You know, human, human mind is prone to error. The technical term is usually fallibilism. So human beings can make mistakes. 
But also, in addition to this, um, we need to, you know, we need to try to resist the temptation to jump to conclusions. In many ways, I feel that doing philosophy in general, just to do philosophy, means to resist the temptation to jump to conclusions. Uh, resist the temptation. And th it is a temptation. It is a very powerful temptation. As I think Daniel Kahneman, somewhere here on my, <laughs> on my bookshelf, says, mind is a machine for jumping to conclusions. We are hardwired by evolution to jump to conclusions. So it's, it takes a lot. It's, it is a skill. It is an art to resist the temptation to jump to conclusions. Uh, um, and uh, um, and the, the ancient skeptics, again, Sexus Empiricus, very prominently behind my back, again, one of my biggest uh, uh, inspirations in this life, um, calls this the principle of epoche, epoche, the, the subtle art of not jumping to conclusions. Um, but basically, basically, the idea is um, something like this, yes, maybe, maybe, hope, I, I really hope this is the way you spell epoche. Um, um, and, but kind of the idea is that, you know, again, between hermeneutics of trust and hermeneutics of suspicion, so, skepticism, but not complete skepticism. Trust, maybe, but not too much. How do you know? What is the middle? What is the middle ground? Again, as as always, I not not always, but as very often it happens, I feel in philosophy, um, the the truth is somewhere in the middle. So there's a middle ground, and it is it is a difficult middle ground to find. Uh, Aristotle has this wonderful word phronesis or phronesis. Uh, uh, and for, for Aristotle, phronesis is sometimes translated into English as savvy, uh, this idea that th th it's a skill that one cultivates through many years of practice. You get like a knack, an intuition as to, you know, how do you find yourself on this middle ground. But it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And also notice, if I, this is kind of the paradox of skepticism. If I uh, urge you to be skeptical, shouldn't you also be skeptical of me? If I urge you to be skeptical, shouldn't you also be skeptical of me? And I think, yes, and that's a very interesting question. How exactly is this uh, uh, situation supposed to work? Again, I sometimes talk about how the University of London gives me a certain, you know, uh, what's their face? Like um, position, indulgence, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, authorization, yeah, <laughs> a certain kind of authorization to speak to you authoritatively. But you should question this, obviously. Uh, and, you know, the, the reasons are many, and in, in some sense, this is maybe the most important question I want to ask. Should you trust me? So, trust me. Trust a doctor. Trust uh, uh, doctors. Or trust physicists. Right, and this this is I feel again a very important question, and like in like the technical, <laughs> the technical uh, topic of the lecture is uh, truth and ideology. Truth and ideology. So we're trying to it's like trusting me. Should you trust me to tell the truth? This is kind of my shorthand. Let's have Nietzsche, Marx, and Buddha here 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 with us because again I feel that all three have something very important to say about truth and ideology. And you see, uh, I, I keep talking, especially in my course in political, uh, sorry, uh, in the philosophy of science, this is what I begin the first class with. Um, I talk about um, how human beings are anxious and mostly unconscious products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution, manufactured by these forces of biological and cultural evolution, not necessarily to be happy, but to fulfill a certain function uh -huh. in the perpetuation of this logic of biological and cultural evolution. And we want things that we don't need, and the things that we truly need are the things that we cannot get. But also, also, the corollary of this stuff is that, it's like, I speak, but, you know, so Rick Roderick, one of my, he's not the deepest philosopher, probably, but he's a very inspira inspirational philosopher for me. Uh, uh, Rick Roderick has this wonderful way of putting it. He says, do you have a good argument or a bad symptom? A good argument, how do you know a good argument from a bad symptom? Mm, mm, mm. I hope you understand what I'm driving at. A good argument, what is the difference between a good argument and a bad symptom? Uh, let's make this more concrete. So it's like when the doctor tells you something, so 
let's 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 start with the doctor. Are they telling you the truth? Uh, and I've explored this elsewhere. There are different ways to formalize this, but you know, it's like a, again, this free and equal discussion. This the zwang, as Habermas would put it, the zwang close and zwang this best certain arguments, the peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. Uh, Roderick actually wrote his dissertation on Habermas, so there's an interesting connection there. So unforced uh, force of the better argument in a free and equal discussion, within a free and equal discussion, free and equal discussion. Again, free and equal discussion is a phrase that is due to John Stuart Mill, a very important phrase for us. But could it be that no, the doctor is lying to you, and the doctor is lying to you because um, we are living, and this is, again, it's like, I am not prepared to call myself a uh, Buddhist, because uh, my respect for Buddhism is immense, but I feel, unfortunately, I am not yet ready to call myself a Buddhist. I hope to be able to call myself a Buddhist in the future. But I am very happy to call myself a Marxist. Although it's a dangerous thing and people will disagree, but this is this is one of the battles I have to fight. Um, it's, it's very difficult being a heretic, right? So Because I feel that m most people who call themselves Marxists, you know, have a very different conception of Marx from me. But, you know, this is this is my maybe one-line explanation as to why I still want to call myself a Marxist despite the danger and the problem. Because very often what the doctors will tell you is, is you know, a, a lie, technically. Well, a, a lie is a complicated word. Like, it's untrue. It's untrue. It's let's Let's use the word untrue. It's not necessarily a conscious lie. But it is a result of misinterpretation, which is due to capitalism. And again, Marx is important for me as an analyst of cap, as an analyst, as a prophet of capitalism. Somebody who fought, who takes capitalism very seriously and who thinks that capitalism is a very is a very good thing, is a wonderful thing. This is what Marx says. Marx, Marx talks about how. So this is a big difference between Marx and Buddha. I'm not sure Buddha would have been. Um, very, you know, like Buddha or Heidegger are critical of capitalism, but Marx wants to use, wants to, you know, hopes that sort of uh, like communism is going to be the next stage of evolution and capitalism is, ne is a necessary uh, stage on the road to that. It is so, a so much more efficient system and that's a good thing for Marx. Anyway, but uh, even though capitalism is a much more efficient system, but also at the same time, it's like you got to understand there are, you know, it's like, again, let's let's stick with medicine because it seems to be a slightly less problematic issue, right? So you know that there are pharmaceutical companies. You know you know that there are governments and they have interests and these interests are structural. These are, again, it's like, uh, uh, so we have, uh, well, I mean, Marx calls, talks about the um, coercive laws of market competition. Coercive laws of market competition. Hmm... So, is it the case that the doctor tells you what is true, or do they, unbeknownst to them, unconsciously? So, it's like, it, it's a, it could be a lie, but like an unconscious lie. It could be a, fa a falsehood, but an unconscious falsehood. So, the doctor is unconsciously complicit with the capitalist system, because actually, the let's say, the treatment that they are prescribing to you is not good for you, but it's good for the corporations because it leads to more profit. But actually, it's not good for you. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Course of laws of market competition, profit and, and not you. Now, of course, Marx doesn't talk nearly enough about the state, and many Marxists after Marx would say that uh, the analysis of the state is something that Marx sorely lacks. Uh, uh, and, you know, I'm happy, like, he, Marx has a basic, some, some preliminary, uh, ideas about analysis of the state, but nothing like a full, fully fledged theory, because also sometimes, you know, the doctors can tell you something that is, broadly speaking, good for the government, but not for you. Foucault calls this governmentality. Governmentality. Uh, governmentality. So, you know, take this drug, it's going to make you miserable, but it's going to make you a more productive citizen. So the first one, the first one is profit for the sake of profit. Uh, 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 and the second one is, uh, um, you know, sta state power for the sake of state power. Now, you could ask, but why do you want state power for the sake of state power? This is called evolution. This is called natural selection. This is called selection pressure. 
efficiency for the sake of efficiency efficiency for the sake of efficiency efficient market efficiency or state sovereign efficiency like international relations efficiency uh, efficiency for the sake of efficiency I actually talk about this quite a lot in my course on Coursera. Um, okay, so, but also, also, something else that we, do, we need not forget. And these are, I suppose, uh, so, let me know, it could be truth, peculiarly unforced force of the better argument, could be uh, uh, a falsehood, because of something like, again, coercive laws of market competition, but also it could be, we don't need to forget biology, Human beings are irrational. This is why I always think it's very important to talk about Freud. And this is like a whole huge, it's like I, 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 I want to do maybe a series of lectures about this and talk about, uh, 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 so, so this human irrationality. Um, talk about Freud, talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, talk about the Buddha, because I think Buddha has a lot to say, you know, Nietzsche maybe, uh, Nietzsche talks about resentment. Uh, 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 obviously, Freud is actually taking a lot of his ideas from Nietzsche, ideas of the unconscious. Um, so basically, sometimes the doctor will tell you a story which makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. So the doctor, in the eyes of the patient, doesn't want to be seen as somebody who's incompetent, right? So th they're telling a story that makes them look good, or like some kind of secret subconscious thing at play. Like, let's imagine... Uh, I understand that all of the, by the way, colleagues, between hermeneutics of trust and hermeneutics of suspicion, you see, this is a very complicated, dangerous waters. Am I saying that you should not trust doctors? No, of course not. You have to trust doctors. I trust doctors, you trust doctors. You know, have you taken pills in your life? Medication, you know, uh, uh, painkillers or, you know, I don't know, anti-inflammation uh, drugs or something like that. Of course, of course, we all have. Or, or, or the vast majority of us have. We rely on mm, the medical system. I mean, I've had a COVID shot this summer. It was a very interesting experience, also philosophically interesting. So I'm not saying that we should not trust doctors, but you cannot trust them completely. So you have to find this difficult middle ground. Anyway, so, so uh, uh, um, again, think about a doctor who is, mm -hmm, think about a doctor who suggests that you, let's say, go on a diet, but secretly, uh, like the, the, the real reason why the doctor prescribes the diet is because the doctor has this narrative about themselves in their own head, about how they are such a great, wonderful person, how they, like, morally good, they, they, they were able to change their diet somehow. Mm -hmm. So the doctor is like secretly bragging to you. The doctor is telling a story about themselves. I mean, uh, uh, Rousseau calls this a more proper, a more proper, right? So it's like uh, the doc or, or or even even just some research. The doctor doesn't know whether the research is true or false, but because they have prescribed this like this you know irrationality, consistency bias. You know, think of, again about modern psychology, all sorts of cognitive biases, right? So because the doctor have prescribed has prescribed this treatment in the past. They would look bad if they go back on their word, right? So even though they realize that maybe they're wrong, it feels uncomfortable to them to, to say that they're wrong. And so they kind of cannot really go back on their word. Like, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's painful to admit that you have made a mistake. I mean, like, me in this course, in the courses that I teach, this is, this is always a problem because I know that in the past I have changed my views. I have changed my opinions. And this is, again, this between hermeneutics of trust and hermeneutics of suspicion. Between trust and suspicion, this is a very difficult space to occupy. Because on the one hand, I want us to be open-minded. I want the students to be open-minded. I want this to be a dialogue. But on the other hand, I think there are some conclusions that we need to reach. And kind of the the uh, the kind of necessity, the necessity of life demands that we make decisions. This is pragmatism, pragmatism. Like you wake up in the morning... And you can try to be like Descartes and think, oh, maybe there's an evil demon or maybe there's the Matrix. But at some point, you got to get up. You got to get out of bed. You got to, it's like, again, I have water in this cup and I have to decide whether to drink it or not. It's like, is it going to poison me or not? It's like, again, it's like COVID shot. You have to make a decision. You either take the COVID shot or not. There is no kind of third option. If you decide to not think about COVID and therefore not take a shot, that's also kind of a decision. You see, that's 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 the interesting situation, but like human condition. I don't know. It's like 
uh, uh, if you wake up tomorrow, Kurt Vonnegut has this wonderful book, Slaughterhouse Five, uh, where this wonderful uh, Billy Pilgrim, uh, main character, wakes up, um, and the aliens have abducted him, and these aliens just have a completely different view of the world, and they try to impart this view of the world to him. Uh, how and and he he gets unstuck in time, and he stops perceiving time in a linear fashion, and they like these. Aliens, Trelfomodorians, like Laplacian demons, they see all points in time simultaneously. The same way I look around this room and I see this room at the same time, they see time like that. They see past, present, and future, and they see people, the metaphor that Vonnegut uses is they see people as centipedes. So what I'm driving at is that if we were like that, or if you wake up tomorrow being abducted by Trelfomodorians, maybe this lecture will become irrelevant. But this is not the situation in which we find ourselves. Uh -huh. So reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. So reason is, is slave to passion. And basically, again, Nietzsche, Marx, and Buddha would, I think, agree with this. But also, very importantly, David Hume says this. And for me, in this course, Martin Heidegger talks about something like this. So I do not have a logical solution to all of these conundrums, but I have a pathological solution. So this is a pathological solution to the problem of how do you, how do you, how do you find a, a balance between skepticism versus um, trust, right? Because you have, you have to, you have to. Pragmatically, life forces you to make decisions. Life forces you to trust some people. Now, of course, and this could be a, another whole lecture about pedagogy, because again, I, I was asking these questions, should you trust me, should you trust doctors, should you trust physicists, and of course I'm giving an example about a doctor, but I could say something very similar about myself and about a physicist. You know, could it be that a physicist is telling you something because of the structure of the university and the capitalist incentives that we have, like seeking grants? Yes, sometimes you, you know, sometimes physical theories could be, you know, physical, false physical theories could persist and be propagated because of, again, these coercive laws of market competition. That's, that's a possibility. Could it be that physicists have, a, have an ego? Ego, right? It's like, and because of their ego, they are hanging on to ideas uh, which are false. And, again, there's plenty of stories about that, like, you know, like that, about you know, physics. You understand. So you shouldn't trust, you shouldn't automatically necessarily trust doctors, trust, phys trust physicists, so you shouldn't also automatically trust me. Um... And um, so, so ideally, again, this this could be another uh, whole, uh, you know, one hour lecture or whatever uh, but about pedagogy. So my approach to pedagogy is I am trying to cultivate free and equal discussion in the seminars, and the idea is the 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 the, the hope the hope is that um, um, through this free and equal discussion, we get into this interesting win win situation. Because it helps your mind develop, and it helps my mind develop at the same time. So this is let me let me just hint at this. This is something that we've, we've been discussing. Igor did a wonderful presentation on Hegel, and then Andre was asking about some very interesting questions about Rousseau. So uh, uh, Rousseau and Hegel. So the hope the hope is that we have a common interest in the free and equal discussion. Common interest in the free and equal discussion. Right. Um, and Rousseau and Hegel basically have this notion of the general will. And the general will is something that, like, objectively we should do. It's good for you, it's good for me. Like, again, this is going to be a controversial example. But let's think about this for a moment, right? So we have COVID, right? And st we're still trying to fight COVID. And if it is true... I'm not saying it is true, but if it were true that vaccines were safe and effective, by the way, I am not a doctor. Should you listen to me? No. <laughs> Do your own research, okay? Or, or talk to professionals. Again, no easy solutions, but certainly you should you should not take my word for it. So again, as, as a professor, not of medicine, but as of, of political philosophy, I have to use this careful language. If vaccines were shown to be safe and effective, or if we had some other treatments, right? So it is patently clear, right, so in, in the general will of the overwhelming majority of the human population to administer the vaccines and get over the pandemic. General will. And again, you could say, well, but how do you derive is from what? How do you say it, it's in the general will? And, and the answer is that this entire picture presupposes 
uh, a commonality of interest, a, co a commonality of interest and also commonality of human nature. There is common interest because there is a home common human nature. So common interest, common human nature. And again, you see, it's very fashionable to talk about, oh, uh, how, you know, who are you to say? And what about censorship? Isn't, isn't this paternalism? And I'm like, well, again, this is between hermetics of trust and hermetics of suspicion. On the one hand, we cannot trust the culture completely, and there's a danger of paternalism. But on the other hand, there's this danger of complete relativism. Because at the end of the day, yes, we have to agree that water nourishes us, and, you know, we need a certain kind of clean air to breathe. And also that, you know, we need to find some kind of a solution to the problem. I mean, like, okay, COVID vaccines have not been around for too long, but we have, for example, vaccines against smallpox. And as far as we can tell, those are overwhelmingly safe and effective, and it is a good idea to get vaccines against smallpox. So an example is smallpox vaccines. And the question is, should you be a skeptic about smallpox vaccines? Even Sextus Empiricus, who, by the way, was an ancient skeptic, but a doctor, talks about how he acquiesces before the appearances. Acquiesces before the, the appearances force themselves upon him as a, as a doctor. It's like, imagine you have a child and you're asking yourself, should, should they get a smallpox pox vaccine? You, 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 kinda, you look around empirically, so this skepticism, skepticism, empiricism, and fallibilism, or skepticism, fallibilism, and empiricism as a solution to skepticism and fallibilism, although an imperfect solution, right? So the appearances force yourself upon you, and you have, you know, like, yes. I'm thirsty, so I will not resist the temptation to drink a glass of water. Like, I have a child, a child, my child is born, and, you know, it's like my, my irrational passions taking care for, for my child force me to administer a vaccine to them. Because it seems to me the best possible course of action, and it seems to be reckless and dangerous to not administer a smallpox vaccine to my child. Because it is, you know, overwhelmingly safe and effective, and the risk is overwhelmingly high. But again, you have to do your own research, right? So, uh, uh, and also very importantly, notice, I want to say that people find this such a strange idea, often, strange and even maybe totalitarian idea. Is this is this really totalitarian? Uh, uh, um, and I want to remind you that there's a different way of phrasing this whole entire debate. And this is in terms of the invisible hand of, of Adam Smith. I mean, a lot of people are going to say that Rousseau and Hegel are totalitarian. But are you going to say that Adam Smith is, a to is totalitarian? Adam Smith's invisible hand, right? Uh, uh, and uh, basically, it, the Adam, Smith's, Adam, Adam Smith's, I'm sorry, invisible hand relies on this idea that human beings have, a, have, a, have, a, have enough of a common interest, have enough of a common human nature, such that the butcher, for their own selfish reasons, will um, deliver fresh meat to you. Because at the end of the day, there's a possibility of this win-win situation. So I started with this uh, question of pedagogy and free and equal discussion. Yes, this is the hope of this invisible hand of the free and equal discussion. That if I am wrong, you're going to show me when, where I am wrong, and this is going to benefit me. And if you are wrong, maybe I'll, I'll help you get over some of the you know, prejudice that you have. And in doing so, we're going to expand our mind and become better at everything. Because as John Stuart Mill says, you know, the right understanding, mental well-being, is the key to all other well-being. Mm -hmm. Again, as Socrates at the beginning of our discipline talks about how basically the ultimate source of excellence in life is knowledge. Knowledge. To be a good doctor, you need, you need to have a good medical theory. To be a good politician, hopefully you need to you need to have a good political theory, and so this kind of brings me uh, um, to I guess um, a very controversial point, and this is again the hope or the question uh, uh, in many philosophers, especially in Hegel and Marx, is can you have a society which doesn't lie to itself? Can you get can you get to truth or some some measure of truth? And you see. The very interesting and very controversial, but also, I think, a very stimulating contention. So we should take it with a grain of salt, but I think we should also take it seriously. So take it with a grain of salt, but seriously, okay? Although it's going to sound outrageous, right? So Hegel and Marx are going to say that it is possible to achieve the end of history, and it is possible to achieve a society where we'll, there will be no ideology. So Hegel and Marx will talk about society which is free from ideology. Now, of course, probably you should say that 
you know, especially if you look at this slide, the way I've set it up, course of laws of market competition, course of laws of competition between state, human irrationality, probably this is more of a utopia. But can, it's like, but again, it doesn't have to be an on-off switch. Can you have a continuum? And can you move closer to this position? Mm -hmm. Can you move closer to a society which is going to be free from ideology? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And so, again, notice, so we keep talking about social sciences. Can social, again, this is the core, the name of the course is philosophy and methodology of the natural and the social sciences. Can the social sciences be really sciences? Like, like math, like geometry, like physics. Well, the idea is, of course, that math and geometry and physics are also subject to political problems. And sometimes even physicists, even mathematicians, there are all sorts of these wonderful ideas about how even in mathematics, you know, because of ego, because of superstition, let's say irrational numbers were considered a problem. Maybe you're not supposed to talk about irrational numbers or negative numbers for a long time were not, were not accepted in mathematics. Now we have the same issue with imaginary numbers. Veritasium recently did a wonderful video. Not, not, not just Veritasium, there's a whole host of wonderful videos about imaginary numbers, the square root of minus one, and how people were like superstitiously afraid of the square root of minus one, but it turns out it's a very useful tool, right? And, and you know, I human irrationality played some part in the fact that it took much longer than we needed to, right, to, to accept that square root of minus one can be a useful tool in, for example, solving, uh, um, you know, third-degree polynomials, cubic equations, right? Anyway, but, you know, Anyway, society free from ideology, continue, move closer. And this is, I want to say, this is for me the most important definition of communism for, for Marx. I mean, Hegel in general calls this the end of history, uh, uh, um, end of history, right? And Marx does so too, the solution to the riddle of history. But this is to me what communism ultimately is about, first and foremost. This is, this is why I'm prepared to fight for Marx and call myself a Marxist, even though for, for the vast majority of people, the word Marx is synonymous with the word Stalin. The name Marx is synonymous with the name Stalin. Nothing can be further from the truth. Nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, I think Marx is the, in the best position to explain the Stalin phenomena and to criticize the Stalin phenomena. But anyway, let me go back a step. So, um, so communism is a society, like, because how can you, how can you guarantee that your doctor or your physicist or your philosophy professor is not lying to you? How can you guarantee that the experts are not lying to you? And I want to say the only way you can guarantee that is if you, if you live in a society of experts, society, uh, 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 of experts. And, and for Marx, the straightforward, and again, ask yourself this question, why do we not live in a society of experts? Why don't most people spend the time and effort to educate themselves? Again, you, you go to a doctor, imagine you have some disease, again, most people have diseases, unfortunately, unfortunate fact of life. You go to a doctor, why don't you open the scientific literature? Why don't you read about p-value, statistics, educate yourself, and take, make a decision together with a doctor? Why don't you? Again, the answer for most people is they have no time. They have no time. They have no time. They have no, no time, no money, no resources. Mm -hmm. So you need uh, 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 time, money. You know, I, let's not use the word money, but time and resources, okay? Including mental resources, education, in order to be able to be an expert. And again, think about, wouldn't we all prefer to be our own doctors? Wouldn't we all prefer to be able to trust the, the, the medical interventions that are recommended to us. And again, the question is, why don't we? Why don't we? Mm, weakness of the will. Akrasia. Uh, um, another important topic to talk about at some point. Again, it's interesting interface between Nietzsche, Marx, and Buddha. Nietzsche, Marx, and Buddha. How human beings are driven by uh, uh, irrationality. And I feel that, again, Marx is going to say that capitalism plays an important ro role even in the weakness of the will. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, who teaches you to be a person? Who teaches you what to eat? Who teaches you, uh, you know, what to watch? Like, who, mm, who decides when you wake up and when you go to bed at night? Capitalism. Capitalism. 
If you're a worker, capitalism decides when you go to bed because you have, you have work in the morning. But if you're a bourgeois, I'll tell you who decides when you go to bed at night. Algorithm. Let's say Netflix algorithm decides when you go, back, go, go to bed at night. You see, this is for Marx, this is very important. Again, this is why I think Nietzsche and Marx have to be read together. For, for Marx, communism isn't a resentful uh, rebellion of the slaves, this logic of revenge, social revenge. Oh, the poor and the downtrodden. No, the co communism is supposed to be a step forward. Again, this genuine commonality of interest. Aren't we all interested in living in society of experts? You and me, the invisible hand, hopefully moving our free and equal discussion into, into the future. Don't, wouldn't we all benefit? And again, it's like, you know, think of the, you know, Think of some kind of social democratic solution, a uh, uh, social democratic intermediate stage between capitalism and communism. I pay money, I pay ta ta taxes, but it's not, it's not Rousseau's evil contract. And I feel that, you know, it's a very important, uh, you know, in many ways what I'm doing right now kind of presupposes that you have watched the 16 lectures on Coursera because I'm using all these concepts, but still. So before Rousseau, kind of, you know, if, you know, if taxation is just theft, that's evil contract, evil contract and in the evil contract taxation is theft but in the true social contract in the genuine commonality of interest taxation is not theft in the true social contract i am happy to pay taxes because they will give time resources and education to my fellow citizens because it is my fellow citizens who are going to supervise the experts. Rousseau says a wonderful thing. I obey the laws so as not to obey masters. Who's going to protect me from being a slave? Only my fellow citizens. Only my fellow citizens can protect me from being a slave. Again, in our one of our readers, we have this wonderful, uh, beautiful painting by Rembrandt. I very, hope, very much hope it's called The Night Watch. The Night Watch. Citizen militia. The only people who are going to protect your freedom is your fellow citizens, citizen militia. So you want to pay taxes because you want your citizens to have time, resources, and, and education to be good citizens. Mm -hmm. So happy to contribute through taxation because you win-win. This is not self-sacrifice. Again, as Marx says, under communism, there is no difference between altruism and egoism. This is called general will. And you see, when people talk about how, oh, you know, relativism of values, how do you, values are essentially contested. I feel that this is a, a capitalist ideology. This is, ideo you know, this mm, some versions of this um, relativism, Some sometimes the word multiculturalism is, is used in this, I think, quite deleterious way, uh, kind of this um, nihilistic capitalist relativism, especially essential contestedness, right? So we're not supposed to talk about values. You have your values, I have my values. This is evil contract. This is evil contract. This is exactly what Marx is talking about in his solution, to, uh, in his, um, on the Jewish question, on the Jewish question, where he talks about how um, liberal rights are rights of uh, atomistic individuals in the war of all against all. This is an evil contract. Again, this is uh, a Marx's critique of liberal negative freedom in the on the Jewish question. Negative liberty, negative freedom that destroys itself. If you didn't understand this, don't worry too much. Um, but I hope at least some ideas are uh, 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 sort of sticking, sticking, sticking in your head. Um, so, so again, so I think, is it possible to have a science of society? I think that the answer is uh, theoretically yes. Practically, we'll see if we're able to achieve this. But I feel that both Rousseau, Nietzsche, and Marx will tell us that there's a roadmap as to how you can get to this society. Now, of course, I have to uh, uh, again, like, why don't we have to? Why don't we have a science of society today? Let me let me be very explicit. Why no? Why um, philosophy is is not like physics today? Philosophy is not physics today. And I feel that the answer is twofold. One uh, uh, part of the answer is uh, um, that I've been talking about is this ideology, the problem of ideology. And again, notice ideology doesn't have to be conscious. It doesn't have to be self, you know, self-conscious. Like sometimes it is the way that the systems are set up, the the structure of scientific grants, the structure of what gets published. The al I mean, the YouTube algorithm doesn't necessarily want to lie to you. It just wants to maximize watch time. And it just so happens that maximizing watch time is usually 
done not through high quality content. The, 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 the newspaper headlines, the headlines that sell newspapers are not necessarily the true headlines. So truth doesn't necessarily sell well. And this is, this is, again, this is why I still want to call myself a Marxist, because I feel that, again, this is a capitalist problem, and this is the biggest problem that we face today as a humanity. It doesn't necessarily sell well. Um, but another issue, another issue, is that is complexity. And I've talked about complexity a lot in the past, and I feel it's an important issue, and one that we should uh, uh, be mindful of. Uh, but, again, this general notion that social sciences are so much more complex than uh, natural sciences. And it's like, physicists have it easy. So it's like, physics, if you don't trust me, uh, open good philosophy physics books. And Sean Carroll is my favorite uh, reference point for this. Physics is simpler than uh, biology, and biology is simpler than, let's say, social science. Uh, uh, so, like, you go to a doctor, and very often the doctor just tells you, you know, you have a complicated disease, we're not sure how to treat it. If, if, you know, if medicine is not all-powerful, if we cannot solve COVID, can't solve COVID, why do you expect, uh, you know, us to be able to solve social problems in a, in a simple fashion? More to be said here, more to be said here. Uh, kind of, when I talk about human irrationality, I mean, ideology, truth doesn't sell well, but also... Um, very importantly, when we talk about so this is this is sort of Marx and capitalism, uh, but in addition to this, there's this notion of um, how we how we trust, you know, the, the 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 danger of rhetoric. So irrationality and rhetoric, and it's 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 interesting because you know Plato talks about this in the Republic. This is what Plato basically, this is what Socrates basically says to Thrasymachus. He says, okay, maybe you're a wonderful rhetorician and you can lie to everybody, but how do you yourself know what is the truth? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a doctor, like a deceitful sham of a doctor, presumably, I mean, maybe you can earn a lot of money, but still you want to have access to good, high-quality medical science because once you get sick, you want to know what is the right... Uh, Medicine to take. So uh, 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 Gorgias in, Plato, in one of Pla in, in Plato's dialogue, Gorgias, Gorgias boasts that if he were to compete against a doctor, he would be able to persuade the people better than the doctor can. But the question is, doesn't the rhetorician also want to get cured? Isn't this in everybody's interest to have a science free from ideology? Um. Yeah. So. I feel I was going somewhere with this idea of irrationality and rhetoric. Um, something important to keep in mind. Well, I mean, again, the general idea that very that very often people tell stories just because you know just because it's pleasant. I mean, think about this. I I'm giving this lecture, but also I enjoy giving lectures, especially in class. Like, to what extent am I saying the truth, and to what extent am I just saying things which sound nice? And just make me feel good. And it's like, you know, you say certain things and people applaud. And you, and you like the sound of applause. Mm -hmm. You don't want a lecturer to be like that. You don't want your scientists to be like that. You don't want them to, you know, want to be applauded. Or at least if they're applauded, you want them to be applauded for the right kinds of reasons. You know, again, like stroking your ego. And I feel, again, this is, this is, this is a very, very important issue and a very important problem in the science, something that we, we want to get over. Oh, yeah. And also, I kind of, you know, I talk about capitalism and truth, etc. But it's like, you know, think about this. And this is this is a question that I've been asking students uh, 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 in the very first um, class. And this is the, the issue of, like, why should you listen to me? You know, why should you listen to me? Why listen to me? Right? Because... B you know, in effect, what I am saying is that um, if you think of the Middle Ages, like university in the Middle Ages, un a university professor in the Middle Ages tells you, you are a serf. It is God's will that you obey the king. Uh -huh. Slaves, obey your 
masters. This is the divine right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So obviously a very problematic statement. And I want to say that you, we, we are in a similar situation. University professor in 2021, right? Like, or let's say, let's say in general, in the 21st century. How do you know if I am telling you the truth or maybe, again, advertent, you know, uh, on purpose or inadvertently, maybe I am lying to you. You see, I, I keep referring to these wonderful books and I say, oh, this is a nice book. It has been published by Oxford University Press. But could it be that Oxford University Press sometimes publishes ideological trash, which is wrong and misleading? And the answer is yes, we have to be open to this possibility. And you have to also be open to the possibility that what I am saying for you know, Marxist or Freudian reasons maybe is wrong, just wrong. I kind of want to make at least a slight nod to the Buddha because I feel that very importantly, very important uh, 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 um, task of philosophy, and again, I keep talking about how philosophy should be to the soul, what medicine is to the body, um, how the Buddha would emphasize clarity of mind, sitting down and meditating and trying to discern emotions in your chest, trying to understand when do you say things because you believe them to be true. There's a peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. And, and sometimes maybe you speak because it just makes you feel good. So again, I feel that again, we, we need to as a society, like if we want to have live in a society of experts, we need to learn to meditate. And again, I'm, religion is a complicated topic, but it's like uh, 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 I want to approach Buddha in this case just as, just as a philosopher, as I would approach Epicurus or Socrates, somebody who's giving, I think, which is good advice. Maybe just a moment of mindfulness. <sighs> Although I do feel that this is, again, I'm happy to call myself a Marxist. And uh, lamentably, I, I should say that I do not feel that I am yet qualified to call myself a Buddhist. Because this, you know, this way of giving lectures is far too unmindful for, for a, 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 some, you know, somebody who meditates full time. I feel a certain tension. This is another topic I want to... Uh, 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 um, come back to yeah. So irrationality, rhetoric, stroking ego. It's like again this again this intellectual, intellectual junk food. I feel again this is I'm not going to talk about this today in detail. Intellectual junk food, like intellectual you know candy, something that is you know something that tastes good, but is actually very bad for you. And, you know, to some extent, this is why we need to meditate. Because how do you know that candy is bad for you? Well, it's like you need to pay attention to what happens to you. It's like, and we, in our capitalist society, very often are so completely unmindful. It's like you eat a chocolate cake and you don't have time to sit and to just feel what the chocolate cake does to your body. Because, you know, Diogenes, somebody you know, gives him a piece of candy and he throws it away. And Diogenes says, away with the tyrant. Because he knows that candy, it's like it tastes nice for one moment, but in general, it doesn't make your life better. This is well, this is the position of Diogenes in you know, this ascetic, ascetic ideal, or ascetic or ascetic ideal. Anyway, but intellectual junk and so much of I think what we are doing is intellectual junk food, rhetoric, rhetoric, something that sounds good, sounds nice. It's whole different, very complicated again relation between philosophy and poetry. Uh, 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 and maybe also philosophy and religion. And I do feel that sort of God is the inter is the ultimate intellectual junk food. God is the ultimate, uh, like like religion is like McDonald's. <laughs> popular forms of religion like McDonald's. T it tastes nice, but it's junk food. So it, it, it was like talking about God makes you immediately feel very sophisticated and very clever and very deep, very profound. But you know. The same, the same way that eating something like a Big Mac it's like a, assaults your senses, but it's not necessarily good food. And likewise, talking about God is not necessarily good food for the brain. It's like, mm, what should you say about God? It's a complicated story for another day. But it's, I'm not, it's like, let's not resist the temptation to jump to conclusion. The ultimate junk 
food. C complexity, complexity, where other people see simplicity. Like, you know, before we talk about God, let's talk about something simpler, like Goldbach's conjecture, before we solve God. It's like, I mean, again, uh, Descartes jumps to these conclusions. He talks about how, well, I have the idea of infinity, therefore the idea of infinity should belong to the infinite being. The infinite being should have all, all the perfections, because if you have one, you must have all. Well, you know, Rene, there are different forms of infinities, countable infinities, uncountable infinities. It's like... Um, and maybe we haven't discovered all of them yet, the, the continuum problems. Like, you know, not so fast, not so fast. Before we talk about God, let's solve Goldbach first, okay? I'm not advocating uh, uh, any particular religious position here. I'm trying to alert your attention, resist the temptation to jump to a conclusion, and alert your attention to the fact that, again, it's like, what is the right interpretation of quantum mechanics? That's a complicated question. Does God exist? Or what, what does the word God mean? That's a more complicated question than your favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics. Do you, colleagues listening to this, have one? And how many hours or maybe years of your life do you need to spend before you can have a, an intelligent opinion about the right interpretation of quantum mechanics? But somehow, very often people feel that, you know, I ask, do you believe in God? And which God? Give me an answer right here on the spot. the old quarrel between philosophy and poetry, but also, but also at the same time, somebody like uh, Buddha, or especially in the Mahayana tradition, later Buddhists, or somebody like Plato is going to say, you know, pedago there's pedagogy. In Buddhism, this is called upaya, skillful means. Uh, uh, Rousseau talks about the lawgiver. So Rousseau's lawgiver. People are irrational. Children are born irrational. So, you, it's like, again, the, 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 met, the upaya metaphor, the story um, in Mahayana is that children are in the house, the house is on fire, the children are too young to understand that they're in danger, the father comes back from the market and shouts to them, run, you're going to burn to death. The children do not understand, so the father takes out candy and lures them out of the house. So sometimes, maybe you need to use rhetoric and persuasion. This, this is a catch-22, circular problem, difficult problem, no easy solutions. This is, this is why science is complicated. Sometimes you have to appeal to irrational emotions. Sometimes you have to sugarcoat. Again, some, mm, Plato calls this noble lie. So let's put it this way. So pedagogy, Upaya, Rousseau's lawgiver, uh, Plato's noble lie. Again, Rousseau's lawgiver, Rousseau, Rousseau talks about how uh, the lawgiver needs to change human nature, so you have to appeal to irrational sentiment. You have to uh, convince without being able to explain. Like, retor sometimes preliminary, on the first step, you need to rhetorically persuade uh, 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 without being able to explain. Because the people will be able to understand the reasons only once they have been able to progress. So ultimately, kind of, this is the alpha and omega. This is the beginning and the end between hermeneutics of trust and hermeneutics of suspicion. This is the problem, and this is the solution. The solution is not simple. It's not even simple. You know, it's not. I cannot even put it in simple terms. But that's the idea. Somehow, we need to recognize that you cannot trust people, but you cannot also not trust people. And how do you know? How do you know? Also, again, long years of uh, study and. Um, Checking for yourself and becoming an expert yourself seems to be the only way, the only surefire way forward. I, not even surefire, because who knows, at the end of the day, as Jean-Paul Sartre reminds us, maybe the tongue will turn into a centipede and the water will poison me and uh, uh, rags of meat will hop along the streets and maybe the Tralfamadorians are going to wake us up and we'll, re we'll recognize all of this as a matrix and nothing exists. We're Boltzmann brains in a simulation or something like that. Anyway, colleagues, I think I'm going to leave you with these interesting ideas. I hope I've been able to stimulate some thoughts in your head. Um, if you have any questions, as always, I would be more than happy to answer. Otherwise, stay safe, take care, and I will see you around. A moment of mind, a customary mo moment of mindfulness at the end of the lecture.